welcome back to another edition of my Thai happy hour we are so excited we've got an extra long extra awesome extra special episode today it's extra I we're so extra this is like the most extra show you will ever get I am George this is Hambo Hambo what do we have in store for the kids today well we have a fantastic show for the kids today we've got our good friend Jonathan Levine here and he is going to be talking about his new band Cyclone Static their record release show their new album dropping on mid 400 records and the time he spent in the art world you, so no porn no porn oh we're gonna have to talk about those dick pics i got for you no george no stop it this is gonna be a great show i can't wait i wish i had a newspaper to roll up and bat you on the nose because you're bad do you want to start with a cocktail or should we go straight to the dick pics no, george or should we go to the interview no no we're gonna start with a cocktail and look i had to get them all week long so last week jonathan oh, we uh made a call for i don't know why i did that was i drinking last week no you were just feeling sassy but and you were off we, your meds well, yeah we basically said you know if anybody wants to send dick pics to hambo to cheer him up go right ahead I, I was plenty happy and what i was did anyone send any of you thankfully no well i didn't realize that oh by me saying it they're gonna find out that well i'm the one who's actually they got the link from you brought it upon yourself and so I got a deluge of dick pics, mostly from our friends. Very, very soon. So I'm not going to tell you. Later, I might show you some of them, but no. I will not tell you. Do I get you. to guess who it is? I will not. You're going to have to guess whose they are. Because I think that's the fun of it. Yeah. Have to look, yeah. Like, all so right, it's we'll definitely... do it throughout the show. I'll yeah. pepper it in. I'll just like throw it at you and be like, here's a dick pic. Yeah. You got to guess which friend it is. My God. So let's start with a cocktail, Hambone. I mean, how do I follow that up? So this year, we are doing a different theme every single month for our cocktails. Uh, January was also known as month. There were cocktails that were known. I got to tell you, I got to be honest. You also known that month. I don't know if I, I should have fought that, like, that to- the theme. Well, being that it's February, it's a little it late for it so now. so weird. I was like, why are we, wait, the topic is literally, literally, they have different names. Yes. Not like they have, like, I don't know, maybe they have gin in them. or I had like a book, and there was well, history. <laughs> How do you argue that? You gave me the book. It's your fault. Oh, by the way, I'm building out a library of our cocktail books Fantastic. on the way down, so you can just grab books. You have to bring the book with you every week now. Now I have to bring a different book every week no, now? You can just borrow them from here. Okay, that'd be All cool. All right, go ahead. Give us books a cocktail. aren't good for my back. Go so ahead. what we're going to do for the month of February is drinks that are made with fire. Because fire. fire, February, the month of love. Now, do you mean they have to be like they have to be lit up to be presented? You're going to light these some bitches up at okay. the end of the cocktail. I'm cool yeah. with that. Oh, yeah. I hate when they don't light them up anymore because of fire code. I really, it bothers me. Yeah. Like they stopped doing the chicken. Jo- I don't know if you've ever been to any tiki bars. Have yeah. you been? I mean, there's Chan's Dragon Inn that's nearby. There's a few other, but they've stopped lighting the food on fire because they claim it then burns the food. Well, here's the thing. So quick little sidebar. I went to a tiki bar that shall remain nameless. And one of their dishes was the chicken monolai. And I used to love it. It's in this vibrant red sauce and when they brought it to you it was lit on fire so i had gone there and i'd ordered it because i have not had it in very many years and they bring it out to me and it's not on fire and i go oh man i I thought you guys used to light this on fire and the waiter looks at me crocks his eyebrow and he goes one second he walks over to the bar gets a shot of 151 literally just dumps it all over my chicken and then lights it up and it just charred the shit out of the chicken yeah so yeah. maybe we shouldn't light the chicken on fire might not be a but good the idea drinks need to but be the drinks fire. so we're gonna start off with a classic it is a hot zombie from 1950 the original... not a volcano not a volcano really yeah okay go ahead i'm throwing you for a curveball oh, go ahead go ahead give it to me don't don't blow up my spot i'm ready like three weeks i got left. so many dicks pics to show you jesus george go ahead <laughs> So this is a classic zombie recipe from 1950, and what's cool about it is, in the end, you're going to light it on fire. Now, side note, you never actually want to light a zombie on fire because then you have a flaming zombie. But this instance, it's okay. So what this is is going to be an ounce of freshly squeezed lime juice, an ounce of freshly squeezed lemon juice, an ounce of pineapple juice. Now, you can just use the store-bought kind. You don't need to go unsweetened. An ounce of the passion fruit syrup because we know George loves that passion fruit I syrup. I love passion fruit. One ounce of light rum, dealer's choice. One ounce of... 151. I'd like to say lemon heart, but I still can't get it up I'm here. I'm working on it. I told you I was working on it. It's been very stressful at work. I will get you this alcohol. Looking at you, I'm lemon this heart. close. I just got to find a distributor for them to send it you. to. So lemon heart 151, an ounce of that, and one tablespoon of brown sugar. Now, this is the classic 1950 recipe. You're not going to find the brown sugar in many of the other zombie recipes. You're going to put one dash of Agnostora bitters in there, and you are going to put it in a shaker full of ice. You're going to shake the shit out of it, and then you want to strain it into a glass that is new with more fresh ice in it. Now, when you are done, you're going to take a little bit of that Lemon Heart 151. You're going to float it on the top of the zombie, and you're going to light that some bitch up, and that's a flaming hot zombie circa 1950. You're welcome. Now, where did you get that from? You got to plug the, the... Well, I got it from the Beach Bum Berry app, Okay, we need which to... has been my number one go-to for all of last, like, every episode. So before we get into our interview, 
Mm-hmm. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, you weren't kidding. He's actually showing me dick pics. That's so artistically can, done. Can you guess who it is? I don't know. It's it's so it's there. Take a guess. I. You got to guess. <laughs> you know him. I'm trying to think of which of our friends don't have tattoos. I had to crop out the rest of his uh, photos. Uh, is it Jose? No, it's circumcised. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Jesus, George. Okay, I will not reveal him on air, but afterwards. You're... <laughs> Jonathan, aren't you glad you joined the show yeah. today? Yeah, I don't want to see that. No, you don't need to see it. <laughs> so, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not doing it for you. This is strictly for Hambone. So, J Jonathan, it's 8.30 right now. What is the over-under that George's meds ran uh, like 40 minutes ago? I take bonus meds now. I think the bonus the meds bonus have worn meds up as well. usually go through tonight or else I'd still have that headache. No, I bonus med around 3 o'clock, and that usually keeps me good through my time happy hour. I will, I'm not buying it tonight. Realistically, I will not be as funny as I am if I'm not if I'm on meds. That's so arguable. better if I'm not on it. And then you curve it with a little bit of alcohol. I... <laughs> Joining us today, how it works. joining us today, one of my favorite people in the world. Thanks, man. Jonathan Levine. I've actually had you on our list for to be on the show for a while. I figured I might as well make sure this show is good before I invite you on, uh, because it took a little while for us to get going. That's three episodes, and, and um, also because uh, you know I kind of wanted a good reason. I, you know, you've been you've been doing a lot lately. Your life has been shifting a lot lately. It has. I think that's a good way to say it. But uh, a little bit of background. Uh, I got into the art world. I collect art. I've got a lot of art in the house. I got more art than I know what to do. Like I can frame because i bought a house that has like 32 windows and nine enough walls which is why i built this room just to hang shit up yeah. because i was like i need some place to put stuff yeah. and um i got into art because of music i discovered frank kozik i discovered poster art tiki uh via shag uh all that kind of like came full circle and when i was learning trying to learn more about uh, at the time, it was rock art screen prints. I think that was what I was into in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, I think uh, Electric Frankenstein had a show at the CBGB's gallery, which you may or not have been involved in, because I know you were around the CBGB's gallery in that time. But from there, uh, I, that led me to Orbit Gallery in Edgewater. A big shout out to Harry Saylor in North Carolina, wherever he's hiding now. We want you back at some point. But from there, uh, I used to get Juxtapose Magazine, where Tin Man Gallery was heavily featured. You had like a full page ad every single month. And I was like, shit, I got to get to New Hope to see this place. And the moment I was about to finally go there, closed down or moved, it was moving. It shut down. And I don't know if it was in Philly first or in New Hope first, but I, I never got to go. So when I found out you were coming to New York, I think our friend Janet Parlor Gallery told me, I got psyched. Was there at your opening when you did your, uh, where you did a big group gallery to open up? Uh, I don't know what year was that, 2005? Yes. Wow. And, and um, you know, was blown away on, on many levels, both because of there being a, and I don't want to call it lowbrow or pop art, but there was an outsider art. I think it's a good way to say it. There's a lot of sure. bullshit terms, but you were presenting different art at a time when New York didn't really have much different. Right. And, um, and we'll go into a little more about the different types of stuff you showed, but it, it blew my mind. That said, okay. Uh, Maybe a year ago, I noticed that you reformed an old band or re kickstarted your music career. And I was like, fuck, that makes you a double whammy to be on the show because we love art and we love rock and roll. Damn right. And uh, we're going to start off this show talking about Cyclone Static, which is your band that may or not be an old band or some form of an old band that you're the drummer for. Yeah. This is a very long winded introduction. I'm not going to make Hambo and do an ad using this introduction. No. <laughs> I was going to say, man. Um, and I guess I just want to know more about Cyclone Static, how it came to be. You have an album coming out this Thursday, tomorrow, I think if we're doing this Wednesday, but you already screwed us up and said we're taping on Tuesday. Yeah. Regardless, um, talk to us a little about Cyclone Static. We'll get to the art later. I want to know how you decide to become a rock star. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I'm going to be. It would be nice to be a rock star. I don't think that's possible. Well, I think it's very hard to become a rock star. I these think days. I think you can do it. You got the look. Well, we'll see. I appreciate it. We'll see. Um, so I grew up playing music on and off. I did a lot of things, and I play the drums. And in the '90s, I, I, I kind of came up through like the public school system, playing drums back in like the '70s. And let's be clear: the New Jersey public school that's system. That's right. Which is definitely something that we need to be clear, because as I've said on many episodes, the punk rock scene in Jersey is better than anywhere else. I'm a hardcore New Jersey. I'm born and raised in my family. I'm, we always say Trenton, Trenton, New Jersey. 
Um, technically, I grew up in Ewing, which mm -hmm. is a suburb of Trenton, although my family's right. lived in the Trenton area for over 125 years. Wow. And uh, the Italian side of my family. Yes. And I do not think you're Jewish just because your last name's Levine. But I I'm would not make that comment. Yeah. <laughs> you're but a pizza I, bagel like my wife. That's right. But uh, your wife's half Jewish, <laughs> yes. Italian, right? Half Jewish. So um, Levine, uh, it's a Jewish name. Obviously, Jonathan Levine, Jewish name. Um, so, uh, yeah, I went through the public school system, learned how to play the drums and play drums. Because I grew up in Trenton, I was near City Gardens, the infamous city gardens yes. five miles from my house and i grew up with that whole scene in its heyday mm -hmm. i'm still friends with randy ellis i just matter of fact saw him a couple of weeks ago who was the the booker there at uh, city gardens randy now he went by his, right. his his real name is randy ellis um and i grew up in that scene um but and i tried to be a singer and blah 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 and i kind of like played drums a little and then in my 20s I picked it up again. I started playing again, and I was in a band called Dry Water in the late '90s, and we were like a New York band, basically. Two of us lived in Jersey City. One of us lived in Brooklyn, and we were playing similar to what Cyclone Static is. Cyclone Static's a little, little bit more. Uh, it's like heavier and probably like edgier and maybe more mature. Mm -hmm. um, and then. I played in that band for three years, and then I stopped playing music. I was 30. I moved back to Trenton. I was living in Jersey City at the time. I moved back to Trenton, and shortly after that, I opened my first gallery. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Can't, don't have time to play music. That makes sense, especially if you're running your own business. So didn't think about it, really barely played the drums for like 14, 15 years. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to like 2014, 15, something like that. I don't remember exactly what year it was. I had fallen out of touch with James, who was the singer of Drywater, mm -hmm. singer, guitar player, singer, songwriter. He had moved from, he grew up in Gravesend, which is next to Bensonhurst, which is, be, it's between Bensonhurst and Coney Island. He grew up in Gravesend, James Salerno. Mm hmm. And so, Goomba from Gravesend. Wait, we can't use. I was recently told that's racist, but you're half Italian, so I'm it's Italian. Okay. I can say that. Okay, we had to he edit can it say out. It. You can't. I would. So, just we're gonna take a little bit of a sidebar. <laughs> I asked a full-blooded Italian at my job if it's racist, a Goomba, and he laughed at me. So I'm like, all right, now I don't even know what to do. I don't want to say it by accident. Like, then it's going to be bad. But, okay, yeah. full-blooded Goomba, go ahead. You're half Italian. You can say it. He I won't say, edit it. I then. make you all can't. sorts of like. Italian racial slurs all the time, so proudly so. Anyway, uh, I'm, a, I'm a proud Italian. I'm a proud New Jersey Italian American. Right? <laughs> so, as also a proud New Jersey Jewish American. Anyway, so James has moved to New Jersey, got married, had two kids. We met up, said, "What are you doing?" We met at a bar. We kind of looked at each other sideways. What are you doing? What are you doing? Had a couple of drinks. She's like, you, are you playing music? He's, no, I'm not playing any music. He's, you want to play sometimes? Like, okay. So we started the jam. And in, in this period of time, he probably doesn't want me to tell people this, but I'm going to do this anyway. He was in the middle of separating from his wife. From the time we've been playing together, he got divorced. He got remarried. I was the best man at his wedding. So a lot of things happened. We just started playing, goofing off, and writing songs. And with no goal or motivation whatsoever. And I started to play again. And I became in love with my instrument again. And around this time, I bought a house. And um, so then I had a place for my... To, I bought out and bought a brand new drum kit. Cool. And now I have three drum kits. And... Um, They're like gremlins. They multiply. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, we just started playing. And we wrote these songs. And... We ended up you know, getting a bass player, and then we ran. Neil, Neil, we started playing out, and immediately I was kind of like, okay, and I was getting good feedback from my friends, and I think I reached out to Neil Sabatino, not realizing it was somebody I knew who had Mint 400 Records, and we met up, we started talking, and he signed us, and now we have this record coming out. So that's kind of what happened. It was very organic. Yeah. It wasn't planned. I didn't have a goal to be like, oh, I'm going to start a band because it's a lot of work, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I just turned 50, and uh, James is a little, he's eight years younger than me. And then Danny, who's our bass player, he's only 35, so he's the baby. And, you know, we didn't really have this <laughs> goal or motivation to like set out to do things, but I have a problem with half assing anything. No, I agree 100%. No half measures. That's why this place looks as good as it does. There you go. Exactly. And I'm and I shortened my lifespan by exactly. a couple decades. But I was able to not half ass it and also not be concerned about 
if anything came, for me it's just like we made a record i'm happy you know like if this is it this is it if it goes on more great if not that's cool too it was really about fulfilling a self you know uh, fulfilling some kind of goal for my prophecy i believe is what they self self-fulfilling prophecy you're like indiana jones in I, the temple of doom i don't know about that that's a good analogy. That's an interesting analogy. I don't know. I, I, that's all I could think of. I would, I would run with it. I'm but, sorry. But just go with it. It was more good. like it was enjoyment. Two friends. We get back together. We develop this really close friendship. We make these songs, and it's really fun. And that was really what it was about. It wasn't about any kind of goal or motivation to have. I mean, it would be completely ridiculous, unless someone can tell me differently, to think you can make a living being like a rock star. Nobody, people, don't, people do not care about... Rock is like a major form of entertainment you know where bands make lots of money and all that it's not really a thing anymore everyone's in the hip hop I, I mean yes I actually just I think it was on Twitter today someone was bitching about how oh it was, uh, it was Adam Levine I guess he got into a fight with uh, Twisted Sister oh your brother sister. yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I was good you just took my joke sorry um, but that's okay it was funnier when you He's said it looking guy. so Twisted Sister and like Sebastian Bach and all of them are like a verbal Twitter war because they've got anything better to do uh, with Adam Levine because Adam Levine said like there's no innovation in rock right now it's all on hip hop, and there is something to be said about that because the, the hip he's not wrong. He's not wrong. I don't necessarily like it, but to say there's not like interesting, we, we, we're going to do that. That does he that rock. What you say? Does he? Does, does he Maroon rock? Five rock? Are they rock? No, they don't rock. That's what I'm like. You know, that's what I'm saying. Because I don't think of Maroon Five as being. I guess they're, they're pop. They're like adult temp. I don't know what the hell they. Are. I was yeah. going to say adult contemporary. No, they're like soft rock. I, it, yeah, it, I, I think saying calling Maroon Five salt, soft rock is almost insulting to people like Chuck Mangione. I don't know. And it feels so good because that's that's light rock at its finest. That's I mean, yacht rock. Maroon Five appeals to fifty-year-old women. That's largely what it's for. Yeah. Does it? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. You have a cool fifty-year-old woman then, or whatever. Yeah. You're. I mean, I don't know where I'm going with that, but in the most part, I think it does appeal to people who have just like no taste and they're like into. You know, I, I, soccer moms. I guess that's where I was going really for mainstream pop music. Yeah. yeah. When, when he, so my thing I hate the most is, uh, and I realize we're gonna have to bump you a few questions. He answered most of them. Yeah, that's fine. But I'll, the I'll thing I hate the most is when you, and this is how I used to pick what girls I would date when I was younger. Really? Before Allison, I may have used it on Allison too. I was always said, "What's your favorite band?" or "What's your favorite kind of music?" And if they gave the, "Oh, I like all kinds of music," I'd be like, "Fuck off." Like, I just, you know, if you like all kind of music, that means you like Z100 at the time or whatever it was. Like, you have no real taste. You just like whatever the fuck's on the radio right now. For me, it was like, if you could give me, like, I love the Descendants or I love, like... Yeah, I'd appreciate that, but if they're hot, I don't care. Yeah. The hard 10 beats most... I like everything ah, answers. Absolutely. I think yeah. you're saying that now you like. that you guys are older, but I believe younger we would have been a little bit more in overtime. Yeah, absolutely. When we younger, yeah. you're like, but yeah, if they were really hot and I had the, <laughs> yeah. and I had the security of myself. Yeah. Uh, are, are you hot? Yes. Are you nice to me? Yes. Can we go eat tacos? Yes. Boom. I was the Holy Trinity right there. That's a triangle. I would change. I was a really <laughs> pretentious. I was a very, very pretentious punk rocker. Yeah. Coming off of a lot of bad relationships when I was in high school. So I think I was like at that point, do you like, you know, name me a band that you actually like. Yeah. Uh, it, it was it was a different thing back in the day when I, you used to used to get references and a resume from someone before you started dating them. Now it's just like swipe right, well, swipe it could, right. It could say, doesn't annoy me. But, so I I don't know what this Tinder thing is, but is there like a, a place for band favorite bands in Tinder? So there is not. There is kind of because you could just put it in your or thing, grinder or whatever you is, like, Hambone. George, come on, son. I'm just saying. I got more dick pics. Yeah, I know. <laughs> let's let's not and say we did, but that's actually not. Uh, so there is a. A music-based dating site that I'm forgetting the name of it off the top of my head, but you, it's all focused on like the music that you like and the cut, the stuff that you're really into. Um, and you try to meet you try to meet people who are mutually into the same kind of shit that you're into. And what I find is that everyone likes the Smashing Pumpkins, and like that's that's like the go-to. Like it's they're all like you it's, if they start with Nirvana, and then they kind of float in that area, the Smashing Pumpkins. And then like whatever like newer rock band is, is out that, now. Is that like like mediocre cool that you everyone kind of like get around? Is that why? like I know people who really love the Smashing Pumpkins because they've loved the Smashing Pumpkins since Christ left Pittsburgh. What I see on these sites is that like okay, there's there's very uh, 
Wait, you never heard that before? No, 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 no never heard that before. <laughs> yeah, was Christ just, in Pittsburgh? It's a, so. a long fucking time ago, yeah. My cousin lives in Pittsburgh. You know, it's got I some good bars. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Shout out to the Lava Lounge. I think that's closed. I it's been a long time since I've been to Pittsburgh. I'm walking it back. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's I know people who like bands because they like bands from when they happened. But then there's a lot of people who I think on these sites will put up the names of bands that they think that people in a certain age bracket would relate to and maybe kind of flock to it's not a bad move i'm not gonna put you i know. gotta be honest with you i would never choose a chick i'm not supposed to say that i would never choose a, a, a woman it's a controversial based, episode based on her music taste i would pick them more on their like creativity they cool hip quirky open-minded i think i throw the easy questions out first though to weed them out <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, I think you'd yeah, find I, that out later. I never asked that. You know, my girlfriend's like into all sorts of weird quirky let's, stuff. Let's she keep thinks... in mind this is when I was like 18, 19. I'm talking now. Yeah, now yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I've, well, been, you've been like 20 I've been years. married for like 20 years. It's yeah, tough. I, don't, I don't know that I had that uh, stringent. If they were hot, I did. So, ha, for me. Have I told, ever told... <laughs> have I ever told you about the app I would like to make if I knew how to make apps? Oh, Lord, what is it? Hellenic Hotties. Oh, my God. It's going to be like Tinder, but for Greeks. And, you can just, oh, and, and everyone has to be topless. That, everyone. That, that everyone. Start. Everyone. You yeah. start with topless. Just, and they just got like how much, but like it's, or just how far down your shirt can be open and how many chains. Or how much chest hair do you how have? How much chest hair or not, depending on the age. Because yeah. like, you know, it's, it's just whether you're Greek American or just overseas. Because yeah. then you also know if they have any money. I mean, there's a lot of stuff you could do with that. I'm definitely going Hellenic Hotties. Everybody owns an island. Cyclone Static. <laughs> Uh, I know people have compared you guys from everything from like New York hardcore from the 80s and like 70s. I've read a lot of comparisons, but I think it's all bullshit. Like, I think you guys have created a band that's pretty much like built in the 1990s. And and I hear it. I mean, your influences are there both um, when you when you talk about uh, bands like, uh, you know, the Super Suckers. I hear them a little bit in there, except you guys don't suck. Um, <laughs> uh, it's in the name. It's in the name. Uh, I, I hear a lot of those. 90 punk rock uh influences as well as like but the po the, the production though sounds modern was that something you went out to achieve no not at all is that just something that's in in you did you just embody that, 90s that punk is, rock that is what, what that is punk rock or it's 90s or i don't know 90s punk rock is definitely a yeah, sound uh, though yeah no i mean it's that's what dry water sounded like that's what james and i know we had there is no predis, you know, we didn't predispose. Can I use that? Is yeah. that right? Yeah, no any, predisposition for, towards any kind of sound whatsoever. You know, James and I, and I talk about James. Danny's like is, uh, you know, because he's younger and he came in a little later. But we had a different bass player before. But he's really into nineties music, so that makes sense. But um, James, J James is an interesting guy because he writes these songs, right? And he's got a really great voice. And he grew up as this total Italian American fucking goomba. Can I curse? Uh, oh yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and he's like I said, he's like eight years younger than me. He grew up listening. He was like Nirvana changed his life, but he was in the classic rock and all that. He wasn't like a punk rock kid. I was a punk rock kid, a hardcore punk rock kid. Um, and that was the funny thing issues we had when we were younger and we were playing because I was like, dude, I wish you could be more edgy. But now it's just different, you know. We we grew up. He's listened to other things. I listened to other things, um, and that's just what comes out of us. And you know, we both love the Beatles. We love classic rock. We love bands like the Pixies and definitely the, heard the Pixies. Yeah, definitely you know, heard the Pixies. So, Frank Black. You know, it's, it's it's weird that he was he makes the music that he makes because he didn't grow up in this punk rock scene like I did. Um, he was just like this Brooklyn kid who went to art school. He's a creative director over at Nickelodeon, actually. He's got a good job. Oh, that's cool. He went to SVA and, like, whatever. He studied illustration, and he was in school when I started playing. He was 20 years old when I started playing with him. We'd play these bars, and he'd be up on stage drinking, thinking he was, like, all oh, the shit, 20 years old. You know, now yeah. he's 42. Been married twice. Um, <laughs> got two children, you know, uh, two sons. Look at you showing up with a box of tea. Just keep yeah. on spilling it, Jonathan. <laughs> so it's pretty funny, but... Uh, yeah, you know, I, it's just that that is an authentic thing we're doing. I don't know that it would seem, uh, and a couple of people had said something else about that, like, like somehow it would be surprising. But I don't, I don't know if you play what you play, right? Right. I mean, sonically, playing what you play works, whether you're 21 or 50. But what about lyrically? Like, talk to me about what's what's it like trying to write lyrics from the headspace that you're in at 50 versus when you were 21. Well, I don't write the songs; he does. Well, there you go. And certainly. 
that he doesn't like to talk about it very much and i'm always like oh. i'm like so uh, what's this because every time we were like trying to do like we we're doing publicity and the, our publicist would be like hey can you tell me about the song and i'd like text him i'd be like james can we talk about the song why do we got to talk about the song i never see anybody do that i don't want to talk about the song blah 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 i'm like come on man give me a fucking break just pick up the phone let's have a conversation i had this conversation with him a couple weeks ago he's driving me fucking crazy i was like get on the phone we got to talk about this it is a little weird it is yeah. a little weird you know you're the drummer and you don't know what your songs are about i mean i don't even want to know oh and it was funny because we had released a song company man and i was like so i was like looking at the lyrics and i was like you know it says company man and confident man he goes well actually i was saying confident man all the time but when we were making the we were writing the song you just started calling a company man because that's what you thought it was and i didn't correct you <laughs> well i was like okay but that's how that's kind of really, you know it's not like you know i wouldn't say that he and i sit down and we have this serious idea about we're having fun yeah. so it doesn't really matter and he doesn't like tell me what the songs the words are and i kind of get him but i don't really care either sound good no, I don't it's, give a it, shit. look it's fine i get Fuck what you're meaning though i mean your whole thing is like not not what the songs are about but just is there a difference in writing now from when you were kids oh, yeah you know uh, you know well you'd have to ask him me personally i do I play differently? He basically will come up with a with a, a song, and depending on what bass player we're working with, we'll start to work it out, and we we'll work it out by playing it over and over again. And me, I play, I sort of like really hone my the drum part I make. Right. And I really like. And other people may they're like, who gives a shit about the drummer? Well, me, I'm paying attention to, and, and I may be playing something really simple, but I'm really all about like it being simple and it like my like whatever if i'm making my hi-hat bark or whatever my crashes yeah. or just what my little fill is and, and it maybe it sounds like a 70 fill or an 80s fill as opposed to like i don't play like a, a 90s i don't play like you know for example and i think he's an amazing drummer is um thursday's drummer Jeff oh, tucker tucker and tucker plays a certain style and he's amazing and i love to watch him he's a monster drummer but yeah i'm a drummer of a certain generation and i play a certain way yeah so absolutely i mean listen for what it is, Tucker is probably pound for pound one of the best drummers I've ever seen in my life. I'm going to make a very controversial statement. Bassist, drummer, most important part of the band. You got fuck all if you don't have a good rhythm section. And if you don't have a good rhythm section, it doesn't really matter what kind of lyrics you're putting out there, what kind of guitar line you have. You got nothing. I don't. I think that's common knowledge. That's I. I think I it is too. But apparently, knowledge. no one knows that. I know. Uh, you know. Honestly, I don't care. Yeah. I like, this is the one thing I like. I like being the drummer in this band. Yeah, it's awesome. And I and I and I like being like the last person people really care about. That's not true. The drummers also have the biggest penis. Speaking of which, oh, don't do it. Really quickly, don't do it, we gotta, I we, don't. Gotta, we, we gotta do we gotta do a quick one. Hold on. <laughs> Neither does the bass player. You do know this person very well. Jesus, George. You you came to our Super Bowl party. Oh my God. Whose penis is this? It's got, a lot, it's got a lot of miles on those tires, George. You don't want to say it, do you? <laughs> it's just put Harvey's dick away, George. <laughs> it's, it's impressive. Uh, I mean, it's one of those ones where you can't tell if it's erect or not. Anyway, uh, moving on with the interne interview. Uh, <laughs> you, know, you know what's funny is that he's, gonna, he's going to compile this down for the uh, Mai Tai Happy Hour website, like the actual transcripts. It's going to read very differently, I'm, I can yes, assure yes. you. Yes, yes. I mean, when I do, well, when it, usually I put the interviews on Cult of George as an interview, and yes, I will probably clean out all the dick pics. <laughs> we also probably will not share the dick pics on the video version because these are our friends' penises. And they were very proud I'm to send them to you. that you sent, I would never send somebody a dick no. pic. No way. Listen, if I'm gonna disappoint you, I'm gonna do it in person. Like, you know, <laughs> why give the secret away up front? So the new album comes out this week on Mint 400 Records. That's right. uh, are you planning a physical release of this record? Like, did you guys sit down and go, "Fuck"? Like, what? Do, like, what do we do? Like, I don't know. At 41, I'd be like, F "Well, no, I'm 41, and I'm also a, uh, I am also a pretentious fucking snob." And I'd be like, "It needs to be on like marble orange 180." vinyl and that's the only will be presented but clearly i don't have the money to do that um and Who i does? just well i don't know i don't know they have, a, they have a record label weezer does there's plenty of bands that put out vinyl they just kickstart i shit. think these are all, these are honest questions for those people who are like care about that sort of thing depending on where you're coming from well most people who listen to this show are like 35 to 50 okay men like it's the right audience men men manly so you know the the label isn't putting out vinyl because you know it's just like it's it's very it's uh, cost prohibitive yes as they say Boom. and um, 
And I was cool with that. It's all digital. Everyone's digital. And it's been a really... This is something I could babble on for a while about like... No, way... we don't need to know the points on, on Spotify. But I do want to know like the thought process. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, I, I don't... I mean, I Fair do kind of want to know, but I don't, that's something that probably only I would care about. But I am curious about... We'll like, talk about it off so air. Listen, it'll break yeah. your heart. CD, v vinyl, listen, do we just go right? digital? Go so ahead. my label's like, we just going digital. Everyone listens digital, right? And I was like, okay, you know, we'll put out vinyl maybe later. I was like, maybe we'll just put it out ourselves. I got a lot of friends who are... who in the music industry who own labels. One of my best friends is Guy Warren Landau who did the record cover. Um, and he's the creative director of Relapse Records. He's one of my closest friends in the entire world. And the guy who owns Relapse, Matt Jacobson, is also a really good friend of mine. Although I have other friends who own labels, but that label in particular, I talk to those guys a lot. And because they're, you know, they're putting out like big bands like Baroness and <laughs> Mastodon and Red Fang and whatever, you know. And I was like, well, what do you think? You know, and like, well, blah, blah, blah. We go back and forth. And uh, I was like, well, you'll just put the vinyl out because you'll make like 300 records for those 300 people who yeah. really want that, you know. That's it. So we're planning on doing that at some point. It's just a three-month process, mm -hmm. right? So um, originally it was, and like, you got to do it around record store day because it can't be like anywhere near record store day. It has to be like six months out, or else no plant will be able to produce it because. Oh, is that so? Oh yeah, I don't know yeah. if you've dealt with that yet, but no. From what I heard from other bands, it's like they can't put out the records at the time of their when the album comes out half the time because the the backlog. There's only like four pressing plants. And the backlog for record store day is insane. Yeah, we've sort of been doing this ass backwards, but it's fine. It's been fun that way because, like, listen, it's not like we're that, that serious about it. I mean, it's good, though. Like, sit, like, legit. It's very good, and I'm not kissing your ass because you're sitting next to me and because you drove to the freaking Headhunters Lounge on a whim knowing you're probably not going to be, like, murdered down here, oh, which is, on. like, I don't know. It's kind of sketchy. What? Uh, no, it's not. But, but, but no, I... <laughs> I know this neighborhood. It's fine. I almost bought a house here. <laughs> you put it out on CD, though. Yeah, so I'll explain, speak to you on that. So uh, it's funny because everyone's like, well, you're not going to have it. When we're about to have the release, everyone's like, well, you're not going to have anything. And so like, I put this thing up on Facebook. I said, does anyone listen to CDs anymore? Okay. You know what? You're fucking wrong. Well, how, how, You're fucking did you, wrong. You should have had a two-point survey. It should have said their name, how old they are, and whether they're like... That's exactly my point, but that's because you're 40 fucking yes. one years old, and I'm 50. But it's weird that anybody over the age... Because your generation... You're not even generation. the same generation as me, but your era and older were the ones that discovered CDs and were like, holy fuck. Like, they had records. They transitioned to CDs and were like, holy shit, this is like the holy grail. I, that's not how I... No, that's not how you got CDs? At all. I Actually, I didn't buy my first CD till I was like 26 years old. I wouldn't buy them. It was really? a rock. See, yeah. I only could afford it. And that was like 1996 or something, or 97, I swear. My first CD player was like when I turned 16. I got Sweet six for my Sweet 16. I didn't get Sweet 16, but I got a CD player. Sure I quit. Shut up. I'll show <laughs> I'll you another dick pic. to you talk to you about the CD thing. Go now. ahead. I'm sorry. So a lot Tangents. of people were like, we listen to CDs. A lot of people were like, no. It's like a lot of people say, yeah, we still listen to CDs. There's a lot of people. What's happened now these days is like a lot of things, things are so compartmentalized. Yeah. And you assume, oh, just like if I had this conversation with Neil, the guy who, uh, who our label owner, right. Mint 400, he would say, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, Neil, that's what you think because you're a certain age. It's just like I work with this girl who's 28. And she doesn't like being on the phone because she doesn't like to talk on the phone because she's 28 years old. And people don't talk on the phone at 28 fucking years old, which is crazy to me. Yeah. So, like, there's this shit happening and we're, like, young. I'm young. I don't feel old. No, you don't no, look of course old. not. But there's, like, depending on what your generation, you're, like, 10 years younger than me. And not to say I, I would never know that. You're, like, a peer. Uh, but the gray beard. I look older than you. I just don't. You know, you get to a point where you don't look at people that way. You yeah. know, And you don't experience that way. But you realize that certain people are just kind of stuck in their thing. So, frank, frankly, they're. And one of my good friends, he makes a living off of selling CDs. Ken Golden. Laser really? CD. This is what he does for a living. He, he, it was him who really, like, you know, hammered the nail in. He said, what are you? He texted me. What are you fucking crazy? Like, you're not going to fucking make a CD. What are you a fucking stunod? And I was just like, OK, then I called him. He called me or whatever. And he was like, bruh, 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 bruh. so I literally like had Orion like make the packaging and I had him printed up in a week. It was like, boom. Yeah. Ah, uh, that is amazing. I can't wait for the record to come out on vinyl. I mean, I look. The packaging is badass, though. I think it's great. You got to open it up. The inside looks cool too. We're gonna do a more expensive version as well. Cool. There are people buying CDs. A lot of people are like, 
I'm going to buy a CD. I listen to CDs in my car. <laughs> and people are like, well, cars don't have CD players anymore. Well, the older ones do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when you're right, you're right. So, <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to sell to the record people. I'm going to sell to the people who listen digitally on Spotify. I've had this conversation so many times. I'm going to sell to the people who make CDs. I am not making cassettes. No, no, no. no. There are people, the younger kids I know, are like, I know, cassettes, I know. cassettes, cassettes, fuck cassettes. You know, there's cassette date, date day now, too. Like, tapes never were good. Like, yeah. they break. Like, it's the That's worst. Right. It's the worst. That's right. There's nothing good about They're that. They're not archival. No, no. they are garbage. And listen, not to shit on anyone's thing. If cassettes are your thing, cool. But spoilers, they were always garbage. Always. Always They're disposable. Garbage. <sighs> You'd have to splice them. I remember having to put together my tape. So ate yep. It. Yeah. Ate it. Because it was just, oh, you didn't clean it every week. Yep. Yeah, because you actually had to clean the heads on the cassette player. <sighs> fucking spoiled kids. You don't fucking You have no idea what you want. Nope. You do not want tapes. It's, wow. uh, no. I'm in the home stretch leading up to my 40th birthday. And listen to how old I am. Listen to the conversation yes. I'm having. You have the next question. <laughs> oh, dude. Uh, so what do you hope to accomplish with the Cyclone Static? My com what I hope to accomplish was, you know, I didn't really know. I want to see how far it goes. If it goes somewhere, great. If not, it doesn't. Whatever. You know, I feel happy we made songs I feel good about. We put out a record I feel okay about. You know, I could nitpick it and be like, oh, if we had a big budget. I really wanted to record with Steve Albini. That was my dream. <laughs> yeah, my buddy just did. Uh, went out there and did it. And he's like, it's it's awesome. Lucky him. Yeah. You know, so, but, you know, all, says con all things considered, fair and equal. You know, being with the resources I had and where we're at in our lives and just, like, not planning it. I'm pretty damn happy. I'm pleased, pleased as punch. Can you say that? Yeah, you, you can, can say that. It's not racist. Please just please just pie please punch, punch. punch please just punch please, please punch, punch. Mm -hmm. so let's let's uh, let's sidetrack a little bit um you said that you know you you were you were 30 you like you do drums you can go into the art world why do you go into the art world instead because clearly that was jumping off the cliff either way yeah it's uh you know what happened was i was uh, i never planned on being a gallerist that was like never like on my radar I was like, oh, when I grow up, I want to own an art gallery in New York City. That was like, no. I was like, when I grow up, I want to be Ringo Starr or John Bonham or some sexy actor like, uh, I don't know. So I'm thinking of somebody like, uh, what's the guy in Pirates of the Caribbean? Johnny Depp. Like Johnny Depp. You know, obviously I don't look like Johnny Depp. But... And you don't want to be Johnny Depp these days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess he's some. I don't. Yeah, there's all have, kinds of stuff yeah. going on. I have a Johnny Depp story, but we don't have to tell that one now. Um, and you know, so it was kind of like yeah, because that's what you know when you're young and you like that's you know. And, and but I you know went to art school too. I was just a creative. I did all sorts of things. Played music, made art, had a fanzine, had a little record label, booked shows, made stuff, sold stuff, whatever. And I started curating shows out of bars. Like first was Maxwell's in Hoboken. Mm -hmm. And I sort of got this bug, and I couldn't stop doing it. And it was sort of like uh, an addiction, and that's always how I explain it. And or maybe it's a calling, I don't know, more of an addiction. And, you know, I just didn't take a regular job. I couldn't do that. I was playing in a band, doing art shows, and just, I guess, you know, the idea of touring didn't really appeal to me at that point in my life. I also felt like... It's easier for me to be in a drummer now because I felt like I had more to say, mm -hmm. and I felt like as a drummer I wasn't going to have as much. I wasn't going to have as much. In, in like sort of like um. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having a a, a, senior, a senior moment. I was going to have like as much influence right. mm -hmm. on you know like culture, and I was really interested in culture and phenomena and really just being engaged and involved in a really f important way. And I didn't feel like playing drums, in a band was going to achieve that. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, I opened a gallery kind of accidentally, too. It wasn't even also that. I mean, I was thinking about doing it. I wanted to do it. I was kind of afraid. I was curating shows, losing money. It's, I had moved back to my mom's house when I was 30. I was working at a bagel shop in Trenton, New Jersey, making $8 an hour. It's a true story. Um, I did that for a couple of years. And then what had happened is my mother and I tried to open a business together, and that was the first Tin Man Alley. But, like, after, I think... We had the opening for it, and it was like a half toy store slash retro home decor, tiki, all this kind mm -hmm. of thing. And, you know, artwork and art as well in the sort of like early stages of lowbrow pop surrealism. 
Uh, I remember the day after she got in a, and I got in a fight, and I didn't talk to her for eight months. <laughs> oh, wow. Sorry, mom, I love you. Um, and so tough going to business with your family. Yeah, no, my mother and I were tight as can be, you know. But like that was a good moment for us. Actually, it helped us grow both as in in our relationship, and um, that was it. I was like, okay, I was thirty two years old. I'm like, this is it. I'm either gonna do this or not gonna do this, and. I'm going to end up pumping gas or something like I didn't really uh, I was not I didn't grow up with this idea. I did get my college education after I bounced around and I got a degree from Montclair State. But I wasn't like I was never on track. It was never like I barely graduated from high school. I didn't go to college right out of high school. And I didn't have this like assumption that my life was going to lay out in a certain way at all. I was just a creative weirdo who didn't want to work for the man. And so there was, you know, the fact that it worked out as well as it did for as long as it did was a fluke. It was really that was a, a fluke. very, very <laughs> long distant fluke. So I've, 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 I have a quick sidebar. Do you know you're the reason why I'm a professional photographer? No, sir. Seriously. So I, um, I, I was making some money beforehand, but I think it was 2007. I, I shot one of your gallery shows and you grabbed me and you're like, you need to photograph the vodka bottles for Christiana Vodka, who was at the time, I guess, back then before 2008, you could actually get vodka companies to sponsor yeah. your gallery openings. Yeah. And so I shot some photo. Like, I'm like, all right, I'm not just going to shoot. I think you just want me to take snapshots to prove that they were there. Yeah. I was like, I'm going to do something fancy. I started shooting the uh, your artwork at the show through the bottles. And uh, I sent them the photos. I um, They were obviously blown away. And I'm like, okay, you can use these. You got to pay me. They paid me, but I also said, hey, if you guys have any event coordinators, any event people you use, you know, throw my name around. And they did. And I ended up getting hooked up with some pretty big uh, event coordinators. I ended up shooting, like, presidents and, and, and a lot of, like, I, I ended up becoming a celebrity uh, birthday party photographer. Like, if you're, like, a pseudo celebrity who, like, needs someone to shoot your birthday party and didn't need them, like, you know, uh, basically th selling the photos to, like, a paparazzi, you hired me. And that was through the people that the contacts I made at Christian. I don't think I ever told you that. That's great. I love to hear stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, and then of course I got sick and tired of that when I dealt with like some. I had a, a some guy try to beat me up. He uh, I was at a MIA's husband's birthday party. He owns like Virgin Records. His dad right. owns some big shot. Oh, his dad's Richard Branson. Uh, no, no, no. Maybe it's not Virgin Records. I'm blanking on his name right now. I'm not gonna don't hold me to that. All right. But uh, it's MIA's husband, or right. maybe ex-husband at this point. Who knows? But I was shooting his thing, and some kid like got mad that I was shooting his photos. Now these idiots invite the paparazzi for the first ten minutes, and then they throw them out, and I stayed. This kid got mad that I was shooting him. Like I'm the birthday party photographer, and he's like, at some point, he's like, "Don't you know who the fuck I am? I'm a motherfucking Rockefeller." <laughs> I'm like, I don't give a shit who you are. I'm here to photograph the party. And then he swung at me and I dodged and got the security guard. I'm like, yeah, this isn't working out. That was the last time I did one of those. And then went on to wedding photography and the rest is history. But thank you very much. Well, I, wanted to, I wanted to give you a big, I don't think I ever said that before. I really, you know, that's great to hear that. You know, like I would say that's wonderful to hear that. I think a lot of people came through the gallery and you were being generous with your time. So you got rewarded for that. Yeah. And you know, uh, for you know, that's great. I'm happy. You know, like that's and that's kind of what, what we were all we were kind of about. It was about yeah. this community, and it was so great. It's not like that anymore. And, and we're we're gonna get into that a little bit. Um, the one thing I always loved about you was that no matter how big your gallery got, if you call big, but I mean, I think it got pretty big. You always stayed true to your DIY roots. You always stayed true. You always take me aside. And just humbly tell me about how, like, you know, you also grew up. We have a very similar background. We both went to Montclair State. Both grew up kind of poor in, like, in the northern, northeastern New Jersey area. Or oh, Trenton, but you know what I mean. Up here, um, except not. Trenton's nowhere near here. But We're you central, know what I mean. Central Jersey. Jersey yeah. guys. We're yeah. Jersey guys. And, uh, there but is you, such a thing as Central Jersey. You always kept that punk rock ethos and what you did no matter how. But even though you had a gallery in Chelsea with, like, every other pretentious gallery in the world, you kind of kept that up. Is that something? You know, how much of a... How much does punk rock culture play in the way you live your life and you ran your gallery, you ran your business? I, I would say 100%. That's what it all came out of. And I probably always talked about that. And it's also what keeps me grounded now that like sort of my gallery doesn't exist in the same way that it used to. And I am transitioning into another stage in my life. And yeah, that was great and fun. And it's kind of over. And, you know, like... I still have the same friends before I started, and they're still my friends, and they live just down the street, and they're my best friends in the whole world, and I, I feel just as good now as I did then because 
I knew what was important to me. I knew what I valued, and that's my friendships, and I know who loves me, and my family loves me, and not to sound that corny, but it's totally true. And I knew that whole time when I was going through all that, I didn't know if it was going to last or not. I mean, I thought it was going to, honestly, I did think it was going to last. It didn't, and I'm okay with that. I'm actually kind of happy about that. Um, but I, I always knew, like, people were blowing so much smoke up my ass at that point in time for whatever 10, 15 years that I was doing that. Um, it, I never felt comfortable with it. And don't get me wrong, I had a lot of fun with it. But I always stayed grounded. I always had the same. One of my best friends is this guy, uh, Don Schnook. <laughs> he goes by the name Shaggy. He used to be in that band of swing neck breakers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I've known him since I was 14, and he's two years older than me. And he still lives in, in Ewing, the town we grew up in. I see him. He comes over to my family's house. He's like my brother. And, you know, he'll still give me shit. Or when I go home, my mom's like, I'm the youngest of all my my Italian side of my family, of all my cousins, and they all show up, and I'm the one who's going out and getting pizza or taking the garbage out or sleeping in the most uncomfortable room <laughs> on the floor. Because, you know, I know yeah. who I am. You know what I'm saying? So, like, all that other that stuff, that's all nonsense. I still get the most joy out of, like, real, genuine friendships. And, I, and, and, and success kind of came to me fairly late in life I would say so I just and I didn't grow up with a lot and I kind of grew up with people giving me shit so like you know when suddenly you had people blowing smoke up your ass you're like yeah I know you don't really care about me and right. when things didn't go so well those people disappeared and it's like yeah that doesn't really bother me that much because you didn't give that shit much shit about me in the first place and I still have all my friends and they still love me the same so you know, but I think it just happened where I just held on to that because I, I, I was that. I was never, I'm not a flashy guy. I don't drive a fancy car. I'm on my second new car at 50 years old. It's a Hyundai Elantra. I love my Hyundai Elantra. You know, it's like I live in a middle class suburb. I bought my first house when I was 45 years old. I, that's what I come from. I'm successful compared to what I came from. Right. You know, I got to, I'm healthy. I just lost 55 pounds. So. Congratulations, man. Looking, That's awesome. Looking pretty, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. You know, just like I, simple things, the really simple things in my life. So like, that's not going to change. You know, I could really be philosophical and talk about how, you know, my parents are getting older and people are getting ill and all that. You got your health. Who gives a shit about the rest? I mean, honestly, who really gives a shit about the rest? So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I'm, I'm glad. I'm, I'm really happy that that happened for you oh. through my space. And and I love it when I hear you know like, Milena and Scott. We have this woman, Milena, used to work for me as a director. She ended up meeting her husband Scott through the gallery. I mean, a lot of people have met, and people have had opportunities, and great things came through the gallery. But the gallery wasn't about me. The gallery was about a community, mm -hmm. and that's what it was always about. And so all these great things happened because of the community, not because of me. So, and I always knew that. I just, people, my name was on it, so people gave me probably more credit than I deserved. Yeah. No, it's it's great, and I think there's a lot to be said. Like, you could always judge a man's character by if he has old friends or not. And that's something that I hold on to and I value as well. Because you, you meet people a lot in this world who will blow smoke up your ass, who will tell you whatever they got to tell you to get by, but in the end of the day, they're not there when the when the house is on fire. That's why he keeps me around. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you and I have been friends now for a, a, while. a while. But, like, you know, you get them, you do it right, you keep them. Yeah, well, you know, the thing of it is, uh, it's, it's, I'm, it's kind of cool we're doing this here in Bloom, Blue, the historical neighborhood of Bloomfield, New Jersey. This is a historical neighborhood on the border of Belleville and Newark. Yeah. And uh, New, North Jersey's got its own thing, you know, but uh, its own sort of like creative. It's different than Central Jersey. Um, but I love Jersey and I love my Jersey people and I love just being around middle class, working class people. I'm a little bit of a classist to be honest with you. And, um, you know, those are the people I want to be around. I don't need to be around, like, don't get me wrong. I actually met Johnny Depp once. He was actually pretty nice to me. I had a really great evening with him. And I sold to famous people and met famous people and all that. And that's all good and fine. But if you don't have a real connection with them, who cares? Yeah. yeah. So you started out in Philadelphia, New Hope, in Pennsylvania, right across Trenton. And you made your way to New York. How different were those worlds? Well, they were really different, but the interesting thing about that was I already had been a curator in New York. 
So yeah, you were at CBGB Gallery. Yeah. So basically, gallery. I had, like had been. Uh, but it's not quite like Maxwell's and CBGB Gallery. Not the same gravitas. You know, but the thing of it was is like it wasn't this. Um, let me try to remember how this all went. Nice Frank Kozik rabbit by the way thank you very much with a little rabbit seen yeah. that one with the sorry um so my add is kicking in um yeah you know like i had basically like i went to i grew up in trenton i lived in oregon for a couple years but i basically lived on and off in northern new jersey i've lived on and off in northern Jer new jersey for 30 years and so i had lived in uh like gone to montclair i lived here i lived down the street from here in Bloomfield for a couple of years, I lived in Montclair, I lived in Jersey City for five years. So I, when I left and I moved back to my mom's house, I sort of had this idea in my head that maybe I would open a gallery. That was kind of the plan. And um, I thought, I'll go to Philadelphia. New Hope was sort of like an accident. I'll go to Philadelphia because it's a small city. I could do really well in a small city. And then I'll go back to New York. My plan was always to go back. Mm -hmm. It was a slingshot. And, and I felt like I was sort of like positioned well for it because my competitors were on the west coast mm -hmm. and i was an east coast guy and to survive in new york in a variety of ways it's much easier if you're from the area mm -hmm. oh yeah like I'm, i was culturally i was supported my family's here my friends were here i was from outside the area you know so but, you know, it was sort of like, I, you know, it wasn't like it happened overnight. Like I was making this plan for like a year to move to New York when I was still in Philly. Like a year, I've been, I wasn't even in Philadelphia for, I was two years in New Hope, two years in Philly. And it was so funny because prior to that, the first six, the six years prior to that, I was just this independent curator and everything was going really slow. And then things started to really speed up. And I ended up being in New Hope less than I thought and Philly less than I thought. When I got to Philly, I was like six months in, I was like, oh, this isn't going to work. I was like, this is not going to work. This is not the place for me. And so when I moved back to New when I moved back up to North Jersey and I moved to Rutherford, interestingly enough, not Jersey City, not New York City, not Brooklyn, you know, I just kind of just got back right in step because all my friends lived up here. It was, it was not, it was scary as hell because I was opening a business in New York City and I took on a 4,000 square foot space and I had this big, elite, you know, rent and all that and all that stuff of owning a, this business and it being really risky was scary. But being in New York itself, I was in North Jersey. I would go home. I would drive to work. I'd park. I'd go to work. I'd, come, I'd work late. I'd come home or I'd go hang out in East Village. That's what I did. Not a bad life. It was easy. Yeah. Yeah. It was I, fun. I, I was just thinking about it from the front from the joke that that Philly is like twenty five years behind the rest of the world. You're right, but I had already lived up here. Yeah, and so I, you knew it. I knew it, and I always knew that that was an advantage I had because I could live on nothing. I was a hustler. I was like a a, a fighter. Like I was a scrapper. And in the art business, you don't have that. People are not like that. I was a complete anomaly. And I knew that about myself. And I knew that like there was really no competition because of that. Yeah. And also coming up in Trenton. I was one of you. Yeah. Doing it. Yeah. You had Philly and New York almost equal distance. Two major cities. Like what other place in the United States you have culturally... You're right in between two. You know, and I think it's interesting. I think I would say about this is, you know, New York art world is like, and, and it's changed a lot now because of the internet's just sort of spread the whole thing out, and made it a very different thing. You know, it was kind of like this wealthy, international, blue blood owned world, right? Although there was a lot of rich Jews up in there too, um, and then people pretending to be like rich or wanting to be rich, whatever that that world. And it was never my thing. I wasn't into it. I was there for the art. I was there to represent the artists that I work with and put them in that place and get them the attention they 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 deserved. And but at the end of the day, the vast majority of the Northeast are working class, blue collar people, middle class people who are like third generation Italian, Irish, Jewish, Greek Americans. And and that's really who has the power in this area, and that is what I am. The yeah. diner, is, the diner owners. That's right. Yeah, that's what I come from. So at the end of the day, I always had that. That had I had my that has my back. So it didn't matter about all that other stuff. So that didn't scare me because I just went back to Rutherford, where people didn't care. They didn't even know what I did. And I remember my my I barely know anyone in my town. Right, when I go I would go to two places, this place to get ice cream. Or coffee in the morning it was ice cream place. 
the Charlie's ice cream and the dry cleaner. I still go to the dry cleaner and um, this guy Barry owns it and we talk all the time. He's Italian American, grew up in Patterson. Like, I was going to him for years. He goes, oh, I saw you. I was uh, I was watching Ovation TV with my wife and his wife Kathy works there too. He did used to do all the uniforms for the Giants and the Jets and all this. And we always talk about football. And uh, he was like, I saw you on TV and it was like this thing about Shepard Fair. He goes like, what do you do? And I've been going there for like five years. He goes, and I go, oh, I own an art gallery. He goes, oh, that's different. And that's kind of <laughs> how it is. Like nobody <laughs> understands what the fuck I do. My family doesn't understand the fuck I do. And yeah. I didn't expect him to. My cousins, I'm so close to my cousins. I see them all the time. We go away every year. My cousin Darren, he's an architect, fancy pants architect, Darren Vickery. And he's always like calls the, my gallery the studio. I don't rec- I don't correct them. My my brother calls it that. My mother calls it that. I'm like, they come to the openings. They they don't know. They don't get it. They don't ca- I don't care though, you know? So, so imagine trying to tell, explain to your Greek immigrant parents. What a public relations person is for a telecom company. Yeah. What 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 do I do? It's PR. It was a lot easier. I could tell them I was a reporter or an editor at a tech magazine well, there you go. or a wedding photographer. But PR, no, no, no. It doesn't. That doesn't work at all. So I I completely hear where you're coming from. No, they don't get it, and they still don't get it. And you know what? I could explain it to them. A hundred times, still not going to get it. But you know what? I don't care. No. Because, you know, I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing and, it for and, me. And they're still proud of you because yeah, they right. see what you're doing. That's right. They feel they love me. They're proud of me. All they care about is, am I a good person? Am I doing right? Am I living a righteous life in some capacity? Depending on how you, you know, quantify that. And, and that's all that matters. And that is why I'm, so, I'm such a happy guy because I have such good people like that in my life. So taking it back a little bit, one of the the biggest things I enjoyed about your gallery was that you got the next question after that. We can continue after, go back on the roll after that. I'm, so, I'm just I know, I just fucked everything up because that's how I do it. I love you, I love you, Ham, but I got to show you another dick pic after this. No. Um, but, Jesus, George. But uh, we, uh, the, one, of the, one thing that I really loved about you was that no matter how big the artist you, you would show, and you used to mix it up, you always had unknown artists mixed in with the known artists you especially you had this love for i I hope i it was i think it was the rio de janeiro with the brazilian art scene you you know these shows you would put on these shows with just either a portion of your gigantic gallery was for them or it'd be a whole group show knowing that you are gambling big time you know i'm sure there's plenty of people that say you were insane for giving premium new york gallery space to artists that have never been heard of before but you did it and you would keep doing it i thought that was pretty awesome i I was crazy yeah i was crazy i definitely ran my business with passion and i was fortunate that it worked so well for so long and that's the honest truth i was really lucky it is something you went out of your way to try to do though i mean that was even though you're, you say you're crazy, that was still part of the master well, plan. It, it needed to be. I was trying to do something culturally significant. Yep. I wanted to do something culturally significant. I wasn't. I never did this for money. I mean, anybody who does what I, there's so many better ways to make money than running an art gallery, and it was my passion, and it was great, and I had such a great run, and it's you know it's still my passion. It's different now. Um, it's, I can't recreate what I recreated before, nor do I want to. Um, that time is gone and passed, and the world has changed. It's a different place. Um, but I, I really believed in people, and I wanted to help people, and that was my goal and my motivation. I believed I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself, and that was always my goal and motivation. Was, was there a reason you focused so much on uh, on the Brazilian, the Rio uh, art scene? Uh, was know, that something you were passionate about? You know what? I've so, there was something about the... Brazilian street art that really resonated with me and I found really exciting and exotic and interesting and it was a different time in the world and I went down there and I was so inspired by that culture and those people and those connections and I could speak for three days on that it's just I had such an amazing experience and I loved that work I mean I I, frankly though I've traveled a lot i traveled to europe and i work with european artists and japanese artists and filipino artists and central american artists but yeah the brazilian thing i felt was like there was something about it and there's a it's kind of a long story how i ended up down there and i ended up going there a lot and um brazil is one of my favorite places i really i think brazil is my the way i look at brazil is brazil is a lot like the u.s in the sense that 
you know, people think, oh, it's Central it's South America. Well, they don't speak Spanish. They speak Portuguese. It's a different mix of people. And it's like America. It's almost the same size as America. has almost the same population. And it's a hybrid culture. It's a different hybrid culture than ours, though. And all this amazing art forms come out of it. It's so rich. And I don't know if I've never been to a place that has so many different rich cultures that come out of it like our country that you guys I don't know if you take it for granted or not but we have all these amazing rich cultures that come out of our country you go to Germany you go to Italy places I love you go to Japan whatever and they have great culture they don't have this huge diverse amount of amazing cultures because they don't have all these different ethnic groups thrown in together of this it's sort of you know big melting pot as it were they're another melting pot and so i just and the people are really sweet and nice and music is awesome it's beautiful there it's just such an amazing place yeah well i think you did a great job bringing a little bit of that here especially with the the street artists i think some of them especially the scale of what they do down there is just so impressive and i know it's not something you can really recreate in your gallery but i think you did a decent job of that. yeah you know i tried i mean that i brought like 14 Brazilians up, you know, and it was like they'd never been to the U.S. before and they were here in the winter and they went out in the snow and they like painted a mural and it was in the Bronx and it was a very, it was magical in so many different ways and I wouldn't say I wouldn't do it again at this point in my life, but, you know, at that point in my life I did, it was great and, you know, it's great that you remember it, yep. you know. Yeah. So, I mean, you run a business with such passion. What is the proudest moment that you've had in your gallery? You got from running the game. Oh, you know, I, the one th my moment that pops in my head immediately when you said that, and I don't know if, really know if it is, but um, it was probably one of the biggest successes. I mean, I, there was a, I got a full page right up in the New York Times in the Sunday's Art and Leisure section, which is kind of, it used to be a big deal. I don't know if it's a big deal now. Um, but uh, it's probably like I had I'd done this show with Shepard, this big exhibition with Shepard yeah. Ferry in 2007. And I had done a double show. I did a show in my space in, in on 20th Street, and then I rented this 7,000-square-foot space in Dumbo in Brooklyn. And it was like this beautiful day, and like 3,000 3, people RSVP'd. I don't know how many actually showed up, but it was l l at least half that. Wow. And there was a line around an avenue block, you know? And I remember the sun being out, and like you say, you're in Dumbo, and you can see like the, I don't know, the Manhattan Bridge or something. I just remember feeling like, oh, wow. This is amazing. Like, this is huge. This is really big. And I'm part of it. And I had a badass suit on, too. I had, like, a, a nice seersucker suit. Nice. I, I, I took the photos. I, I also still have the dollar bills. Oh, you do? I have a bunch of them. Yeah, somewhere out there. I, you I think were I, there. Yeah, I was there. That was, I was amazing, there. It was amazing. Right? It, was, it was one of the most impressive uh, exhibits I'd seen. It's also when Shep Ferry was, was killing it because he had changed his style from... From, you know, the traditional, he had a very, he definitely moved more into the fine art world with that show because he was trying new things and different types of mixed media. Maybe that's not the right word, but he's stepping out of what he was it doing. It was a moment. Yeah. It was a moment. Mm. And, uh, you know, again, I don't expect to have these moments I've had. And I had so many amazing moments in my career. And I don't expect, I don't really need another one. I don't expect another one. Because I had so many. We of get them. your your platinum record with Cyclone Static. <laughs> That's next. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know if I could handle that, even if that were to happen. To be honest <laughs> with you. So I, I I have very little shame. I'm known as a person who has I have no shame for the oh, you most don't part. Say. No shame. Uh, but one of the most embarrassing moments of my life also happened to your gallery. Is it a poo uh, story? You might, no, it's not a poo story. It actually isn't because I don't really feel shame with poo. I do that. You know, I have problems with poo all the time. <laughs> but uh, this is one of the most I had never felt so bad. And I don't think you even knew it was happening. I think you did because I think you gave me a present because of it, uh, which I have hanging upstairs. Um, I was you were doing a group exhibit it was a big group show i think maybe your anniversary show and people were fucking painting like at, minutes before the show was starting there's artists still not finished with their work and it was packed his his gallery was known for getting packed getting hot just overfilled for the preview shows not even for That's like right. the gallery openings <laughs> and and there's a billion people in there and i was shooting it uh i shot all of jonathan's uh most of his new york shows uh up until about 2000 
uh, 14 for Juxtapose. Uh, it was the New York uh, gallery photographer before they killed uh, photography out of the magazine. Yeah, so every crafty girl I've dated who had Juxtapose. Yeah, yeah. In it, it saw yeah. my photos, uh, of especially of Jonathan's gallery. But So I was photographing it, and you know, I, what I would try to do is to make them different. I would do like funny shots with the, with the artists, with their work. But I was just doing candid stuff around the room, but the gallery was so tight. And all of a sudden, uh, Melina, who I didn't know she was your director, I thought she was your PR person at the she time. She was then. She became my direct, one of my directors. She yeah. uh, she starts screaming, and I'm like, "What's wrong?" And she's freaking out. She's like, "You've been shot. You're bleeding, or you've been stabbed. You're bleeding," and I have no idea what she's talking about. I'm like, "I'm fine. I'm not in pain." And she's literally, she was just freaking out. And then I noticed that I had like red running right down my side from my kidney whole back side of my shirt which i guess was a light color was red like blood red and i'm like no i'm not bleeding. but i i think i think i actually got startled too when i thought i'm like oh it's wet it's bleeding i'm bleeding i don't know where i'm bleeding from we run to the kitchen on my like, table i think her like fiance boyfriend was there we we're trying to figure out where i'm bleeding from no i clipped like a ten thousand dollar piece of art that hadn't dried yet <laughs> Like, the, like it was just a clip. Oh my. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 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 I think I saw what the price tag was on it. It had a heart attack. Cause I was like, I just fucked up a piece of like, I fucked up a piece of art. No, actually I don't remember this, but, yeah, um, but I was always so wasted and there were so many damn people that I couldn't fucking remember. <laughs> anyway. she, she, and, and to her credit, Melina was not upset at, no, all, not at all. She's she like, worried about you. Yeah. And I'm just, she's like ruined, she, ruined a shirt of mine. And I'm just like, I, all I thought, like I saw, we had to go try to find out which piece of art it was. Cause we weren't sure. And I, I, I clearly had dragged the paint around and, uh, it was, I had pretty much smeared a, uh, a canvas. Well, it serves that fucking artist right for not fucking That's finishing That's exactly it. what you said. Yeah. <laughs> when you were told, I think you called me up the next day to apologize for ruining my shirt, and that's exactly what you said. You're like, he should have finished it ahead of time. He should have been finishing it there. That's not your fault. Yeah, I saw the price tag on it. I was like, I don't have insurance that I think it cover <laughs> this painting. Like I don't know, but you're like, no. I talked to the I talked to the artist and I, I yelled at like he shouldn't have done that. He shouldn't have been left under like wet artwork in the gallery when we're selling it. Like that's crazy. And then you sent me, uh, uh, you gave me Shag's uh, uh, the Raven print that you guys had exclusive oh, okay. of. I have it hanging upstairs. So just uh, that was my most. That was probably my. Most, I had never felt more unprofessional in my life. Yeah. Like I'm, my job is to like be. And I just like clipped well, it. Well, you know, not for nothing. It's not like the gallery was always. I try to keep it un, in check, but we had so many people there. Everybody was partying. We're creatives. We were young. We were having fun. And, you know, I'm not going to get into any of the gritty details, but, you know, things people shouldn't be doing, they were doing, you know. No, I, I was in the back room. I know. I know. <laughs> I, I've many times. That's why I used to keep my gear in your back room. In the, uh, in the in the in the like kitchen area that yes, you used to have over right. there, but anyway, I just wanted to thought I thought you'd find that a little bit that's funny. Hilarious, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And and to Milena's credit, she was more concerned about your your yes, well being. She did a very and good she's job. She's a beautiful, wonderful person. So. Uh, Still a friend of mine. So at the end of the day, you offered a uh, wall space to, ba wall space to artists that never would have had a chance in New York City. Uh, hindsight being what it is, did you accomplish what you set to achieve in New York? Absolutely, 100%. You know, I really thought that maybe I had, I, I at some point I had bigger, I envisioned maybe more, but like I, that would be greedy. And I was so spoiled with so much success for so long and probably took it a little bit for granted. Cause it just ha kept happening, you know, must've been cause I was so fucking great. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, but I be like the, at the end of the day, I did it my way, you know, I did it my way. Just like, you know, was that Frank and then Sid? Um, I, I always did it my way. So there's nothing at the end of the day that I, I can, I can say this and I say this quite often that like I did, I did everything I set out to do cause I did it as hard as I could. And I, I risked everything for it and i have no regrets in terms of that i will never go like i didn't try that i didn't try to do the best that i can in the way that i do it listen i could have done it different but it wouldn't have been like i could have had rich backers and shown different art and rubbed elbows with people in a different way and not been like a punk rock dude in the art world but that's not who i am yeah so i get to walk away from that and be like 
feel okay about myself. So yeah, no, I don't. I, I did. I did set out to do everything. The, the fact of the matter is, one of the reasons that the business doesn't work anymore is because, in a way, I did too good of a job. Maybe you know, to some extent, I helped sort of help mainstream what it is that I do, such that it kind of became not a niche market anymore. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, on that end of it, being a punk rocker, curating and, and running a gallery, I mean, I'm sure there's artists that you have that you represented that you thought should have been bigger. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like, any one particular come to mind? You know what? I'm not going to say because... Um, you don't want them to, like, get, feel bad that they're not bigger than they no, are. No. You know what? There's some artists... I'm, there's an artist I'm thinking on the top of my head, and this is, like, one of the things we talk about in my other podcast. Well, some artists, I just think people don't recognize them and that works great and that's just my opinion just like you and i we could all sit around and talk about some obscure band that like we really love that band a lot but you we know that they're not meant for the the, the general public some like weird obscure hardcore band or experimental band or something we know the general public's not gonna really be into that um but there's some artists that i've worked with that could have been a lot more successful but they have too many personal issues that get in the way. Right. They have too many bad business practices. There's too many things that come to play. It's not just about the art. It's about so many other things. And you could say that you talk about musicians. You know, maybe some, maybe they have some substance abuse, prob substance abuse problem. Maybe they have some, you know, mental health issue. Uh, maybe they just, you know, whatever. Maybe they're on the spectrum. Um art world is hard period and the story is not supposed to be easy i'll say this over and over again so you know if you get to do it at all and have any semblance of success then lucky on you um but yeah there's certainly and 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 on that note there are artists out there that have done really well that you're just like what the fuck but that's got to do with marketing yeah same and, thing in rock and roll man that's right same thing in rock and, and roll and, and to be fair there are also artists that that you know, I mean, I was inspired. The, I think the the biggest artist that I s discovered through your gallery, that I went on to just be enamored with, that I have a piece in my in my in my dining room is Adam Wallcouch. I think that was maybe one of the first shows I ever saw was him. Uh, What's up, Adam? <laughs> hey, Adam. Uh, I absolutely one of the when I saw the uh, he had the uh, the octopus chandeliers up first before anyone else. Oh wow! That at least outside the Philly area. Yeah. And and when it's I saw one of those, gorgeous. I'm like, one day I'm gonna have one of these. And you know, I was very lucky that you started making more like smaller pieces that I could actually fit in my dining room that were kind of affordable. So that was someone I I could I, I could honestly say I saw it there first because I remember you did one exhibit in your little room with that, and I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. And everyone's seen them, who's seen it has been blown away by oh, yeah. by the by the chandelier. Oh, yeah. So that is someone that I think, and it's not what you would consider art. In the traditional right. sense, sense, so I think that's really what you brought uh, to to the rest beyond just lowbrow, and that's where lowbrow doesn't make sense. You know, that's where it is definitely more of a uh, definitely a counterculture to art. Um, but yeah. uh, so I can't lie, I was very sad to find out that your gallery was closing. I saw the Facebook post that everybody else saw. I actually went to go to uh, one of your, I went to, they had the open house at the Jersey City location, and uh, I went to find your gallery, and you weren't there, or I think it just wasn't open there, and I was like, oh, that sucks. And then, like, very soon afterwards, I got the, uh, I got the Facebook message that you were closing shop. I mean, I, I can't lie, it wasn't, you know, I have a lot of friends who have businesses, you know, went different directions, so I, w I wasn't terribly surprised, but I was also very heartbroken. Um, and so this is where it gets really depressing. Um, what was it, you know, was it a tough decision to, to fold the gallery? Uh, when I did it, no. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't like a decision that happened overnight. I figure it did. I mean, you moved so, from New York to Jersey City. Yeah, you know, it, it just, it, it's a system that, um, and it's a really long conversation, but it's a system there's the system that I came up with. It the gallery business has become much like the music business, and it doesn't. The way we ran our business and the way we represented artists and that sort of thing, it doesn't work anymore. The only way it works is if you have you're really wealthy and you can just afford to do it and not make any money. <laughs> and 
as we, you know, I'm not that guy. And so, but also I wouldn't do it for that reason. I, you know, I, I opened my business because it needed to be there. Like I did it because it was needed. So there was a, a hole in the market in a way, that's a way you can talk about it. There was a need and I filled it. And now that need is no longer needed. I mean, artists are getting, they can just go on Instagram and there's thousands, millions to choose from. It's just ridiculous. Like accessibility is there. It wasn't before. So, you know, I was needed, but I'm not anymore. So you're still needed. Don't put yourself down that much. Well, I'm not. I, I mean, think the curation part is still there because I think there's also a lot of shit out in the world. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, here's the thing is people don't really there's sort of this whole conversation about like this hierarchy of taste and about how it's one of the issues that we had with the presidential election in the sense that uh you know people were reading tons of news for news sources and not knowing what to trust and believing nonsense be it far right or for far left and it's the same with everything all things, all bit sources of information. It's why the the uh, the newspaper industry has a, such a hard time. All sort of industries that are like news industries, be it music industry, arts industry, they're all having a hard time because there are everyone has a voice now. So it, um, it kind of kills that hierarchy of taste. So you know, sort of the goal a lot of time for us all as DIY people is to like make things really accessible, but that also takes away from people too, and for better or for worse. Um, so it was just time for me to not do that anymore because it just, I, I was, I was not needed in the way that I, I was before, because if I, if I was needed in the way I was before the, the money would be there and the money was no longer there. So it was time for me to change and I'm still in the transition to be honest with you. So that's that. So with that, I mean, how have you seen the art culture shift in the past two decades? I wouldn't even say the past two decades. I say the past like three or four years, art culture. What's happened is everyone's online. Everyone's on Instagram. The gallery model is falling apart. More people are more. The average public, the general public, is more engaged in visual arts than ever, which is great for visual artists. There's more visual artists making some money than instead of a handful of artists making a lot of money. Now lots of artists make a little bit of money. Um so, I mean, it's it's just all become incredibly democratized. Right. And that has its pros and cons. Well, do you think it's become more ephemeral with less of a focus on ownership because it's so... Yeah, that's true. You know, I mean, moving. I think uh, they talk about how it's just about liking. Although I would venture to say that probably more people are consuming art and buying it than before, but they're buying it from, instead of buying it from like 100 artists, they're buying it from you know, a million artists, you know, like maybe that's a complete exaggeration. I don't really know what the numbers are, but it's really spread out. So it's hard for people to make money. Artists will complain, like, I can't make enough money. I sold, you know, 30 pieces this year or whatever, 10 pieces, and it's enough to sort of supplement my income, but I can't make a living off of it. So, you know, that's just the reality. Yeah. yeah. It makes sense. Do you have any regrets? Is there anything you would have done differently? <laughs> uh, that you can speak to? <laughs> you know, uh, not really. No, not really. I mean, like hindsight hindsight being 2020, there are things I would have done differently. But the the things uh, but I wouldn't have. You know, like I didn't make any huge mistakes. Things just changed and there was no way to forecast. It that. sounds almost like the record business it's in two thousand eight totally like happening that. now in the art business. It's totally that. And since I'm not as it's totally that the way I consume art is different because I can't afford to buy a, a piece of art every week. You know, it, it's not like buying a record. It's different. So I don't I'm not as in tune to that. But it sounds almost like the the whole completely like that. It's the best analogy there is out there that I can think of. The music industry. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so, you know, and and you know what? You can't hold on. Yeah. You got to move on to the next thing. I mean, it was bound to catch up. Yeah. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. It is what it is. And when things change, you move on. There you go. You can't hold on. I'm too young to hold on. No, nope, you, you have a lot ahead of you. Uh, tell us a little about the Jonathan Levine project, though. How? What are you doing? I mean, are you just, is this a holding pattern, or are you just, you know, what is 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 it something that's going to exist online? What are you looking? Well, it at does. Right now? You know, the Jonathan Levine projects is can basically be whatever I want it to be. It can be just a complete 
creative outlet for me. At this point in time, we're doing online exhibitions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we'll actually do physical exhibitions because I do have a new physical space, but I won't do them very often. Um, it'll be right now it's a lot of secondary market stuff but do you know what that means when i say that? is that when you're not the primary so you're you're sub no i have no idea second I, mean, I could try to yeah, guess no, okay but... so primary market is you know is we were predominantly a primary market gallery that way we work directly with the artists and we sell it to the public secondary market is that work has already been sold the collector is now sitting on it for a while and they're like hey i want to sell it you're not dealing with the artist you're dealing with the client and you're reselling it it's a resale so it's like being a new uh, used car salesman in a way um so yeah. <laughs> but and, and so i'm focusing on that and just like lots of other things I, I may um i'm gonna be launching an app soon it's gonna be called levine and we'll see how well it does it's gonna be a lifestyle app it'll have art music fashion culture and it'll sort of be a hub for people to purchase things through other companies oh cool so it's it's gonna be better than the fire app but not as good as hellenic hotties that's right <laughs> exactly it's kind of where we're going with exactly we'll see what happens so you know with this i mean i think the thing we got to talk about is your record release show because you yeah. have an album coming out yeah and uh if i'm gonna plug it for you real quick the cyclone statics cyclone static static is, oh, what's the name of the album Starting from or from scratch. From scratch. From okay. scratch. I didn't get the name wrong. Rug release and dance party, mm -hmm. which is something very important to note, is going to be happening this Thursday at FM in Jersey City. Uh, so by the time this episode drops, you could watch our episode, and you can go see the show. So I have one last question. Okay. <laughs> okay. Has anyone asked you if Cyclone Static is like a midlife crisis? Like instead of buying a car or something, you decide to like form a rock and roll band. No, not at all. That's great because that's where I would have gone. I've gotten like my wife been like seriously. No. You you want the mom. Corvette or yeah? No, take the I, Porsche. I, I you know I think I had a mid life crisis when I was like eighteen. <laughs> I don't. That's just not part of my. Like, that's just not my thing. You know, I didn't get married. I don't have kids. I do have a girlfriend. I've been together for seven years. We I was own, gonna say I think I met her. We own a house. Yeah, you know, it's like, but I don't have kids and I don't really. I don't really view life in that way. So it's just like life for me is like a road, you know? I mean, I don't either, but people still say it to me. Uh, and I'm just like... Maybe someone said it. I'm like, I bought the motorcycle at like 25. Like there's yeah. nothing going on now. I just do what I do and fuck you. I never did anything on track or on schedule ever. And yeah. I will never do it. It's just not how I am. Amen, good brother. That's the way to be. I mean, listen, if it works for you, great. If not, it doesn't work for me. So whatever floats your boat. So whose is this? Oh, Jesus Christ. Is that yours? No, that's not mine. I would never use mine. I would well, never do that to All you. the hair's cropped out, so I don't know. Just put it away. No. It's like a baby's arm clutching an apple. One more. This was, no! This was Jesus diseased. Christ. My God. Yes. So those are it the... It looks like Gollum from The Hobbit. I know. It's weird. I think that one's cancerous. I'm not oh. sure. But it's where you don't have the ones that are like the micro penises that were on. I'm, one sure, of I'm them, sure that's later that in, the, been, in the slideshow. I have to tell you, I was at this, uh, I went to like this uh, sauna or like, a, you know, it was like spa. Fancy spa. Right. You guys know this fancy spa? It's up in like Edgewater? Yes, yes. Uh, everybody's been talking about it. That's Is where. Is it a rub and tuck place? Uh, no, 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 no. Jess and Steph go there. I don't know what it's called. <laughs> like, people go it's like there. 60 bucks all day. It's phenomenal. It's mostly wonderful. There's like a. Uh... There's a. There's an infinity pool that yes. looks over New York. It's, yes. It's, it's oh, that's in New Jersey? Yeah, yes. it's Edgewater. Oh, it's sure. really nice. I highly nice. recommend it. My girlfriend for Christmas, she gave me a. So we went. And there was a guy running around. He had a micro penis. I'm like, dude, he didn't have his. First of all, I don't know why he wasn't wearing a bathing suit. I think that's him. illegal. No, no, no. You can. Okay. And you can. I mean, having no, a no, micro no, in the men's section. Yes. Okay. He was in the men's section. He's running around with a micro penis. I'm like, what are you nuts? Dude? Oh, well, you know Put what, man? You ran into the guy who was on the cover of Nirvana's Nevermind album. Some parts grew up. Some parts didn't. And we're gonna we're gonna just go leave I met it that, that kid before. Did oh, you oh, really? Jesus Christ! Of course <laughs> He's you did. one of Shepard's assistants. <laughs> Uh, the kid who was the baby. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> yeah, but, now you just did it. Now you ruined it. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Jonathan. We're going to bring you back another day to talk about sci-fi and some other stuff because I think you are actually enjoying being here. I am. Um, how can the kids reach you? How can they find out more about you? Oh, we come to JonathanLevineProjects.com. And you can look up Cyclone Static. CycloneStatic.com, but we have a Facebook page, a Bandcamp page, Spotify page, an Instagram page. 
Cyclone Static. You can buy it wherever CDs are sold, which I don't know where you would. Well, no, you can't really. You can buy it from us on on our Bandcamp page. It may get distributed. Um, it's on. It's digitally on Spotify, Apple Music. It's being distributed in all sort of formats that it streams music. Yeah. Well, I, again, I thank you very much for joining us today. This has been an excellent episode of My Thai Happy Hour. Uh, I think we went on tangents. You couldn't believe it. We got to hear the saga of Jonathan Levine. I think you should share this. It's just like, wow, everything I have, like all the questions everybody's been asking me that I have not wanted to answer, here you go. This just answers everything. Yeah. You don't need to like <laughs> ask me about the gallery or anything ever again. Oh, we got an FAQ. Wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. Uh, again, encourage everybody to rate, review, and su subscribe to the show. Hambone, how can the kids reach you? You can find me on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire, where I post mostly pictures of other podcasts I produce and my adventures. You can also find me on Twitter at Hambreaker, where I mostly tweet about professional wrestling and Dungeons and & Dragons. And you can definitely find me on Thursday night at the FM in Jersey City for the Cyclone Static record release party. Sadly, your music didn't queue up. I apologize. I could have just been singing Informer. <laughs> it's cool, and, man. And I'm, I'm kind of depressed, though, that it's not queue up. And now i got to find out whether our theme music is going to play. Let's see... Uh, Let's see. No, there is like, oh, I forgot to plug it in. Fix it in post. Yeah. My answer for everything. I don't fix shit in Fuck post. Fuck it. We'll fix it in post. Keep talking about what podcast you're dropping this week. Uh, this week, uh, the new episode of the Casual Interactions podcast will be out. And also, uh, you can check out my other podcast, the Vintage RPG podcast, wherever podcasts are found. Jonathan, what's your podcast called? Oh, I have a podcast I'm doing with my friend Yorg. It's called Helium Talk. Mm. Oh, that's a good. Helium name. Talk. It's on Spotify. He does a variety of them, but we do a sub series on it. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I will. I, I'm gonna put out the request now. You no longer need to send any more dick, dick pics to me for Hambone. That's not the way it was supposed to work. It was never supposed to work. It was can, never supposed to happen. We can still do ask Hambone anything, or you ask me any questions, and I parlay it to him. You can still questions are fine. If you are a crafty girl still looking oh, for Jesus love, Christ, right, right over here. He's still available. It's perfectly fine, unless he hasn't told me something, which is really fun. I've got nothing to tell. It's okay. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you, you living the life you live. Out. I, I kind of do a little bit. I listen. I kind of do. Listen, when, when the season of depression ends, I will leave my house. Just so again. you know that it's when, coming. Just so you know when Hellenic, when Hellenic Hotties comes out, when it's Ugh. created, it's gonna be it's gonna you. you. It's up, gonna bro. be you. But I'm gonna have to like darken you up a little bit. Put a little bit of chest hair on there. I have chest and, hair. Ah, uh, you don't really have chest hair. You don't have Greek chest hair. It's not like mine is like sick, like freaking. This is trimmed. All right, he's this got me beat. trimmed. It's like ah, uh, it's like a Mongolian like Greek or something. I don't know what I'm saying there. But anyway, you can. Uh, I have music. You that's can reach. My music. You can. I got music. You, oh, that's your music. I'm gonna use his music today. You can reach me at GLK Creative on Instagram. You can reach me at GLK Creative on the Twitters. I'm at cultofgeorge.com where all my weirdo writings. And musings are hosted. You can find all the old episodes of My Thai Happy Hour, Hour at MyTaiTV.com. Rate, review, and subscribe to the show. Uh, is there anything else we need to plug? I think that's it. This is a long episode. This it's is a great good. episode. You are the best, Hambo. I love having you with George. me. Jonathan, you are awesome. You've been an amazing inspiration throughout my life. I appreciate Thank having you, you appreciate on it. here today. I'm going to get all like fuzzy and warm and stuff. Hambo, take us out. Everybody remember, be nice. Aloha. Yeah,